and officially announce it. Okay, welcome to the weekly More Customers Faster training. My name is Robert Stanley, and today we're going to talk about market research, probably the key and critical thing when it comes to advertising online, or really just starting a business, period. If you write a business plan, there's a whole section on market research and marketing and things like that. You're supposed to know what the market is doing before you start a business uh, anywhere. And we have a huge advantage these days with the amount of data that's available for us immediately. And as marketers, uh, you know, it gives us a tremendous set of tools to build advertising for our clients and for ourselves, and really just outperform the people who don't do this research because most people don't do this. So if you're one of those people that thinks, oh, you know, I can just wing it and figure it out. I'll tell you right now, you're wrong. Uh, I used to be one of those people. I, I'm a very much an action taker. And what I figured out after a while is that if you take action too quickly without a little bit of planning, uh, you're going to fail or at a minimum, you'll lose money. So here's the deal. So what I, what I tend to do, so I'm going to use an example here. I tend to work with uh, local businesses or I have in the past and or um, celebrity author, speaker, guru types. But uh, so for, for today, though, we're going to talk as if uh, we were doing research for an attorney. Uh, and I'm going to show you kind of the steps that I would follow and maybe the, the steps that you could follow if you're doing research. Now, if you're in the retail space, if you're doing uh, internet marketing or online selling of shoes or, or whatever, the same steps apply. There are some things that you probably would do a little bit differently, and we can talk about that in future sessions. But for today, we're going to act as if we were local marketers. So one of the keys to quickly understanding a market is just looking at your competition. But one of the things I, I almost always do before I even go that direction is I go to Google Trends. So uh, it used to be called something else, which is failing to enter my mind at the moment. But anyway, if you go to google.com forward slash trends, you can look at what's trending right now, which is great if you're an affiliate marketer, you can kind of see what people are interested in. Um, but more importantly, you can type in a, a keyword. So if you were doing research for a bankruptcy attorney, um, whoops, what I do, because this is a, a very large data set, you're not going to be able to find um, bankruptcy information for you know a specific state typically. So what I do is I just type in kind of a root keyword or an anchor keyword, and then I just see what the overall trend is. So you can see that obviously when the uh, bubble burst over here, we had a big spike in bankruptcy. Now we're, our, our search for that term alone uh, is, is pretty low. So let's go, although Netherlands seems to be trending here. So what I typically do is I just look and I kind of see what's in here, and then there's a uh, related topic which is lawyer profession so I might click on that and see what we get law industry you can see the United States kicks up here so that's just lawyer it just took us to lawyer so that was related term that's interesting um, so I'm gonna click on the United States because that's where I'm at you can click on any country you want now if you're searching if you're doing research in a specific uh, state or city what's great about this is that you can have this really broad term and then you can drill down into a location. Uh, I actually showed this to a gentleman who was looking to expand his business. He was in Arizona and was going to expand into another state. We just typed in his primary keyword phrase and then we saw that the trend really dictated that he should go to a different state than what he had originally thought. So you can kind of get a sense. Now one of the things you have to be careful about here is that this is 2004 to present data. So one of the things I like to do is play with this and just see how it changed. So if you go in the last 12 months, you'll notice that the list of states in terms of search volume have changed uh, in the last 12 months versus the entire time that uh, Google has been collecting this data. So if you go to 2013, you'll see yet a, a different thing. So um, this is important as well as to play around with these different settings and see kind of how it impacts the trends and the, and the information that you're going to pull up. So let's click on Michigan since it's our top one here and just see if there's any keywords that come up. And then this is, this is interesting. If you have enough data, if a location has enough data, you can actually see all the way down into like a, a smaller geography within the state. So you know, we can see that Detroit is 100, so that's the highest. 
Now that's not a search volume. This is like a statistical figure. So it doesn't mean 100 people were searching. It just means of all the data they've collected in this area in Michigan, Detroit was the top. Um, Flint and then Grand Rapids. So and then you can kind of look at these other ones. There's, there's zeros. Doesn't mean that there's no search volume there. It just means in relationship to these other locations, they just didn't even register on the radar. Okay. So this is kind of neat. You can actually view the change over time. They have a little timeline thing that actually kind of walks you through. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, so if I was, if I was going to open a uh, bankruptcy practice, or if I was going to run advertising on a, for a local bankruptcy attorney in, Michi in uh, Michigan, then I would probably recommend that we hit Flint and Detroit as the primary spots. So typically, if you click on one of these, then you'll get no additional data. Although this one seems to be good. So the number one phrase is Detroit bankruptcy, and then Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and then bankruptcy in Michigan. So these are your kind of geographic specific keyword phrases. What's interesting about this in certain niches as you drill down you'll actually get different search terms you know in Michigan than you would in California you know uh, obviously the the location uh, variables will be different but um, people just express themselves differently in different locations and in different countries so this is a good way to also get a sense of how people um, will type in phrases or look for things because a lot of times we make the mistake of just going into some sort of keyword tool and just saying okay bankruptcy so it's just everybody's going to type Detroit bankruptcy if they're in Detroit they're going to type you know San Diego bankruptcy if they're in San Diego that isn't always the case so you need to verify that and then you can see this this kind of like timeline of where things are spiking so it kind of makes sense December end of the year let's see if this is also December no July so um, you can you can take look take a look at those different things. So in my case, though, what I want to do is I want to go back because I think I'm doing uh, San Diego for our example. So I'm going to go over here to California, and we'll see. Now, some of sometimes this stuff is just pure logic based, right? Obviously, there's more people in LA than there are in many other parts of California. Um, so and you look how large that is on the map compared to San Diego, this little tiny thing here. So you can see, you know, bankruptcy California, file bankruptcy. So all these keywords are words that I would probably use as roots. Um, one of the other things that I'll do, let's click on San Diego because that's where we're going to look. You can see Carlsbad. Wow, that's like that's like uh, rich people live there. Surprised to see that top of the list. Um, so Carlsbad is a hot spot for bankruptcy. Now. Where else can you use this? Not only can you use this like in Google AdWords and SEO, but you can use it in Facebook because you can target people by geography on Facebook if you're in Facebook ads. So let's say I was opening a bankruptcy practice here in the San Diego area. I might just target Carlsbad and Encinitas first uh, and see what happens. Um, so let's see here. I am going to take you to this. Okay, so if I type in... San Diego bankruptcy attorney and the Google search bar. I don't really care about the results at this point because I'm still just kind of checking out the market. What I like to do is go all the way to the bottom and look at the related search fields. Okay. This is what, now not only is this useful for SEO if you're an SEO person because these are terms that Google considers related. And if you've been around the SEO game for a while, you probably remember the wheel. Uh, the, I forget what it was called. I think we just called it the wheel and it would show a um, diagram version of this of how these keywords relate to each other. But um, so you can see all this stuff. So what I might do though is also drill this down specifically to the location and keyword, root keyword there, and then look at these different related terms. So something that you'll notice that came up twice is San Diego bankruptcy attorney reviews. So obviously people, and we all know this, People are really concerned about reviews and never mind the fact that most people just don't trust attorneys by default. So um, one of the things that you can do with this, it's really easy. You just kind of copy this, you right click copy, and then you can just paste it right into Excel and basically create your own sets of keywords. The other thing you can do is paste those things into the Google keyword tool. So you have to have a Google AdWords account to use this. But you can basically just copy and paste all those different things in here, right? 
and then we can set our United our targeting to United States San Diego. Um, and then let's remove United States and then say get estimates. If it's gonna work, there we go. Okay, so I have like nothing. Google says, mm, sorry, you're not gonna get anything from this. So um, all of these say nothing. What I found is that they lie. <laughs> And probably what, what we would need to do to get an actual uh, estimate, because people are searching for that, otherwise they wouldn't put them in as related keywords. And I can actually show you at some point how to um, um, if you run an AdWords campaign, how to see what the long tail uh, keyword was that was actually used. So let's just see um, keywords. Let's delete, and then we'll add a keyword. So what I'm doing now is, because they're not giving me stats, is I'm just um, removing some of the tail off the long tail, so to speak. Oopsie. I can't see the screen very well, so that's why I'm slow to type there. Okay, so now now you're they're uh, giving us some costs and, and so on and so forth. So one of the things you can also do is you could just change this to California because AdWords I've found um, the, one of the things you have to be aware of with Google is that they don't want to reveal too much information about their secret sauce. <laughs> And so as a, as a result, they kind of change things on here and, and obscure things. That's one of the reasons that third-party tools are used. And I like these two in particular. So I like SEMrush and uh, Keyword Spy. Now, I, I pay for SEMrush, and I use the free version of uh, Keyword Spy. But I've used both of these as free tools in the past. So you can type in anything you want, or you can put in domains. So one of the things that I'll do as part of my competitive research uh, on here is I'll look at local ads, uh, online and national, and, and uh, print. When I say local, like actual print advertising. So I'll get the yellow pages and, and look for people that are advertising the yellow pages, type their names in, that kind of thing. Not only just to get a sense of are people spending money on that particular niche, but also for copywriting and swipe. Um, if you're not in the habit of looking for good advertising and, you know, even if it's print material, grab it, stick it on a flatbed scanner and uh, keep it. Oh, yeah. Ron says it was called the Wonder Wheel. You're right. The old Google search term was the Wonder Wheel. So anyway, so back to this. So we'll go to click on keywords. It actually knows automatically. You don't even have to put that in there. Um, so we'll put in San Diego bankruptcy, United States. See what happens here. Okay, so one of the first things that you want to look for, let's just say that you were doing this for yourself, you know, you're going to start a business or something, is does that keyword, are people paying for it? And they are, right? And they're paying a lot. They're paying, you know, looks like a, upwards of $60 a click or something for some of these. Now, uh, what that tells me is that it's a high value phrase, right? And so when you're dealing with uh, niches that are less expensive, so maybe the cost per clicks are between 50 cents and $5, you really wanna be going after the terms that people are paying $5 for because there's an implied value associated with that term. In other words, it, it should be turning into money for them. The other thing is uh, when you look at Keyword Spy, it actually gives you all these different uh, ads so these are basically some of the other ads that are running. And uh, they'll give you organic competitors, PPC. Now, SEMrush will do the same thing. I usually just look at both just to kind of see a comparative of like, you know, who's being shown up here and who's on SEMrush. So I just uh, shorten my typing 
session here by putting it in SEM Rush. And so just just so that you're aware, what I'm what I do typically when I'm doing research like this doesn't matter if it's for a affiliate product or for a, a client or whatever. I'm just kind of browsing around to get a sense of what does the market feel like. What does it look like people are doing? Does it look like this is trending up or down? That kind of stuff. And so you can see again, there's they're saying a uh, average cost per click of twenty three dollars ninety one cents. Let's see what these guys said. Twenty six ninety seven. So you could estimate it's between twenty three and twenty seven, right? And um, uh, it'll, they'll give you the search engine keywords, the ads, the URLs for the ads. So if you actually hover over here, then you get these ads, and you can export all this stuff as an Excel file. I don't know if they'll let me ex export it without. Oh yeah, they will. Um, because I'm not logged in. Am I now? I didn't want to log in because I don't want you to see what I see and they give you a little bit different stuff in a, in a paid account. Um, so you can see all this stuff. One of the things that I've, I like, let's see if they have it on here. They'll give you, um, let me click on this domain. Maybe it'll show you. I'll show you here in a second. If it'll, it'll bring it up. Yeah. So, uh, media ads, are, are something that are, are really useful, right? So you can actually see media ads being like banner ads and, and uh, Google Content Network ads. Um, these are the competitors in the advertising space. And what's interesting about this is that it shows you how many keywords they have in common with each other. So what you really want to do is get those common keywords and find out what they are, right? And, and leverage those and go after those. Um, what I found also with these trends, because I've actually compared these graphs as far as the domains go with actual clients whose campaigns I manage and such, these are totally inaccurate. It's old, old data, but they're kind of close, you know, not really great, but kind of close. So you just kind of have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, so one of the things, where's, where's our competitive competitor graph? See how long this takes here. Okay, so this is um, basically on the number of keywords that they have matched, who the who the competitors are, and what their ad spend is. This kind of stuff is really cool to like uh, screenshot and stick into your report if you're going to send it to your client or keep it on file or export it or whatever. But again, like I said, what I'm really just trying to do is get a sense of what's going on in the world here. So one of the things I'll do when I type in like San Diego bankruptcy and then I see these different folks that are advertising is that um, sometimes I'll click on the ads, but a lot of time I'll just I'll just take the URL like that and I'll just stick it in here. Got to get rid of the HTTP stuff. And then so what you'll typically find is that you'll get a you'll get kind of the same data, but then you'll also get all of their ads. So right, just looking looking here, I only see one ad, but I can see because they're scraping it. Look, there's their $999 bankruptcy, but I can see all their different advertisements. This is huge because it gives you a place to start. It's like swipe and deploy. It gives you a place to start in terms of advertising copy. You should collect this stuff from, you know, like the top three to five uh, bankruptcy attorneys or other competitors in your niche. Now you can see there they've got nothing in organic. So they've either been Google slapped or it's a new website or something like that. Um, but you can see what keywords they're targeting for, what position they typically are, are listed at, and that sort of thing. Um, and then who their competitors are, which we could probably also see here. Now, what, what you need to know about this is this is competitors that SEM Rush has been collecting over a period of time. These are the competitors you're seeing right now. Like you never know if one of these people are running an ad for a week and then they turn it off, right? And then the other thing is they don't always get uh, like your maps listings and maps uh, ratings and things like that. And when you talk to clients, what you'll also find is that the stuff that shows up here isn't necessarily people they consider to be competitors. Uh, business owners and attorneys and other people, they have a really interesting perception of who their competitors are. And it doesn't necessarily match up with what you find online. Um, so it's if you give them that information, then they they see a lot of value in it because not everyone's doing that for them. They're saying, "Hey, look, as far as online goes, that, those aren't your competitors at all. These guys are." 
So you collect all this stuff, right? Or just get a sense of the market, you collect all this stuff. What I do is I typically just use, um, there's a couple tools I'll use. I'll use Evernote. If you're not a, uh, a user of Evernote, Evernote's great for this because it has a browser plugin that just allows you to screenshot that uh, page. Let's see if it's on this actual browser here. So you can go, for example, I can go here. Oh, here it is. Here's my Evernote plugin. So you click it, and then you can just say, okay, the file, uh, you can put it into a um, folders, basically. I have a folder called Swipe Files. Then I can add a tag to it and just say, all right, the tag is um, San Diego, and then uh, bankruptcy. And now you have something for the future, and then you just save it in your folder, and it's searchable, and you'll have this whole page. Um, so you basically you can collect all this stuff up, or if you you're not that complicated, you can just take screenshots, paste it into Word or something like that. So you, once you gather up all this data here, uh, one of the things that you want to do is, uh, you know, we we talked about how you can find keywords, but we really want to organize it by the high value keywords. So you only want to if you guys have read uh, Perry Marshall's 80-20 marketing book, um, then what you what you want to do is pay attention to the top 20%. So if there's if there are um, you know 20 keywords that you're looking at, 20% would be four. Now that's not very many keywords, so maybe you'd extend it to five. But you get the drift. So you want to look at the top 20% key phrases, and then you can look at the associated competition for those top phrases. Uh, um, you also want to look at volume. So if it's a high cost per click, but the volume is extremely low, it doesn't do you much good if only one person searching a month, but you know, people are bidding a million dollars for the click, right? So you want to balance those two items together. So you want the highest volume and the highest cost per click associated. And then that's what you're going to go base your decision on. Now I just talked to you about capturing funnels and getting, uh, um, printed materials so the, the easiest way to do that, like I said, is to use um, Evernote. But if you're going to go through like an actual funnel, so let's, for example, let's go over here. Let's just click on one of these guys' ads. We'll click on this $999 ad. I'd probably just cost him $20 for that click. If you're on here, Mr. Bulldog, send me a bill. Um, Okay, first of all, this page sucks, but whatever. So so this is this is the landing page. So if you're consulting with a client, then what you're going to do, typically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a screenshot of this and I'll mark it up and I'll say things I like about it and things that I don't like about it. So the one thing I do like about it is that it's the it's very easy to see. I mean, he's got a clear offer. His ad even says $999. So if you click at the click on the ad, the good thing about the clicks that he gets probably are that other than them being competitors and market researchers like myself, is that people that are clicking on an ad that has a price on it are buyers, right? Because they know that it's not free. When you go to his page, he's not saying, you know, free bankruptcy consultation. Um, he's unselling here a little bit. I don't know that I would put this stuff in here. But so what I would do is I would take a screenshot of this and then I would mark it up. And you can do that right inside Evernote as well. So let me show you that. So you can actually use their little... Um, their little uh, screenshotting tool and you can, you know, put in a arrow, you can put in some text. So now you can share, you can share this with your prospect or you can just build it into your report or just keep it as for your own notes. Um, so this is, this is a really good way. So what I typically do is when I'm doing the research and I'm, I'm swiping these funnels and landing pages, I probably wouldn't fill out the get help now thing, although I might I might just click on the button, cancel this, and just see how it works. Okay, so in my experience as a marketer, that's a bad way to do it. So he has the classic, you know, move you to a contact form. And um, I wouldn't do that. What I would do is, is what you see a lot of marketers doing now, right, is the light box pop up. Uh, we do that for a lot of landing pages. So when you click the button, it pops a form up right on the screen. And um, 
that way they're not going anywhere. You're not going to lose them. Now it does impact your bounce rates, which is a metric that some people care about. I don't really care about that. I care about my leads. So um, anyway, so that's one thing I would comment on. So I would probably show this to a prospect or a client say, Hey, I like it. This button here is a little vague. I'd probably make it red or orange or something. So it stands out more. And then I would make it so that instead of it going here, I'd make the, the button pop up on the screen right here. Now he has the, he has the, you know, contact information here and that might be why he thinks he needs to uh, do it. Oh, why does he have Las Vegas on here? That's ridiculous. Oh, boo boo right there. Um, you could still put the phone number on the pop-up form too. So anyway, and then this is also a classic thing, which I don't agree with that attorneys do. Real estate agents do it too. They put their cell, their face all over everything. And like the first rule of the marketing is the what's in it for me, right? Who cares about this guy? I care about my problem and my issues and myself. Um, other than if that particular picture builds some sort of trust. So if it's him with his family, that could build trust. If it's him standing with a client and the client's got a testimonial quote next to their face or something, that's going to build trust. But just having your face up there um, isn't necessarily going to do much for you. If he's just, unless he's one of those branding guys, right? He's got commercials with his bulldog and his face all over the world. And maybe that works for him because um, branding does work. It does work, uh, particularly for these guys. So let's go back to our thing. So what I would do again, I would I probably click on two or three different ads. If not, I um, just find them in SEM Rush, so I'm not you know spending their money. And I would grab uh, print and print material and scan it. Uh, typically, what I do with my print material uh, stuff is that I I'm not typically grabbing it as part of a research campaign for a client. I just am on the lookout all the time. Let me see if I can find one that's an example. Oh. Yeah, so this is one I, I showed in um, my um, lead generation seminar. So this is one I, I snagged. If you can see it, it says five. This is a, a, a banner advertisement that I saw. The five warning signs of prostate cancer. Click here. And so this is a really good ad. Uh, and for obvious reasons, it has a nice call to action on it right there. Um, this particular image, he looks concerned. Right, and that's probably the target demographic because of prostate cancer. You're not going to have a 22-year-old guy on here, right? So, this is a, a really great banner ad. And these types of banner ads, because I've tested them and I have buddies have tested them, are kind of what we call direct response banners. They work really well. So you want to grab stuff like that and throw it into a folder on your Dropbox or on your computer somewhere, so that you can grab, you know, reuse it over and over again because it just that stuff never. Uh, it goes out of style. Let me see. Um, let me see if I can find one more. I wanted to give you a print example. Might have to save that for the next one because I'm not seeing it here. Here. Um, okay, so this is one. I, I grabbed it because it was... Um, to me, it was the Weston Princeville and I grabbed the, let's see, what else did they have? A trifold. This is because I had a vacation client. Oh, and, and so check this out. So they had this offer where they're giving you six. This is one of those uh, timeshare deals. They have, you know, six days, five nights, whatever. And they have all the points that you're going to get. They're going to give you uh, money towards a rental car, everything. And you only have to pay $850. This is another example of a qualified offer, right? So you're not going to call them unless you're willing to spend $850 to go to Hawaii. And in there, they included a really nice brochure that shows all the cool stuff that you're going to get. I recorded the phone call. They had a really nice phone script. Um, one of the things that you'll find with clients and maybe even with yourself is that some people forget about the step beyond the offer or the sales letter. Like this is the sales letter, right? What's equally important to this letter to get the person to call is the person that answers and that that particular conversation be scripted and it should be split tested just like any other piece of marketing and um, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, let's see. There's one other one I want to show you and then we're, we're kind of out of time and let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. 
Social Security Survey. This one I thought was interesting because this is actually not the Social Security, you know, this is not the the government Social Security system, right? This is an ad. Basically, Social Security Administration Mid-America Program Service Center um, believes that it uh, surveys the Deputy Commissioner for Quality Performance Social Security Administration important keep this proof social security doc. oh maybe this is this is legitimate what was i why did i grab this oh i grabbed this because there's another ad that i got this is a legitimate one and the reason i grabbed that is because i had one that wasn't legitimate i'm not sure i can find it i have to find it for you guys but i had another one that was from an air conditioning company and it was related to the i don't know if you guys remember the rebates that they were doing for energy usage or whatever. It looked almost exactly like that. So, um, and basically they were trying to make themselves look like official government-ish. So uh, this is all stuff you use for copywriting. So you use your swipe files, your Evernote, and screen records. I have tons of videos that I've recorded of myself going through, you know, Ryan Dice funnels or even uh, weight loss funnels or various things. And then I've got a bunch of tools. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of a, f a few more of those tools and then I'm going to show you how I compile and use that information as well. So um, we're past our time for today, but uh, we'll continue this uh, part two where we're going to actually dive a little bit deeper and compile this into something that's usable for our bankruptcy example uh, next week. Uh, what I'll do though is I'll take a, a couple questions and then see uh, see what you guys have to say and if uh, nothing we'll move on so ron says um what would you use for a light box pop for the pop-up light box oh okay so if you um good question ron if you're not much of a programmer uh if you go to leadgenerationpages.com sign up for the lead pages um landing page stuff they have a tool that allows you to create those and you just you basically create the button inside their tool and then you paste it into the website and then it, it does that for you. Um, otherwise, you can get a programmer to do it pretty easily with something like Gravity Forms. Um, we have our own thing called Jump Forms. Mike says, are these webinars found on your YouTube channel? Yes, some of them are. I've been uh, bad about posting them lately. But yes, this, this one in particular will be on the YouTube channel. And um, I will post that there by tomorrow. And uh, you can get there, by the way, by going to morecustomersfaster.com. I'm sorry, youtube.com forward slash morecustomersfaster. Sorry about that. The Facebook ads one. Yeah, I didn't post that one yet, Mike. I'll post it. Uh, I'll post it today because I have it here. I just didn't do it last week. Any other questions? Yes, no. Mike says, excellent. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll continue this discussion next week and then uh, try to turn it into a campaign as well that you guys can uh, check out. So uh, thanks for your time to get today and uh, we'll see you next week.